Welcome, everybody. It's nice to have you here. And uh, today, I'd like to share with you a very important topic, which I haven't given a lot of attention to recently, but it's uh, very, very important. And that is the um, significance of meaning in our lives and understanding where meaning comes from and uh, and how, if we have the wrong understanding of meaning, then it's extremely disempowering and problematic in our lives. And uh, by having the proper understanding of meaning and the right relationship with meaning, it allows us to be empowered and to live our lives the way that we're intended to live. So that's going to be the topic for today. And um, before I get to that, I want to give a, a, a little bit of an introduction, which just is to cover some of the basics so that we're all on the same page. Uh, number one, of course, I wanna make sure that uh, you can know if you're in the right place or not. So I wanna tell you about the intention of this meeting. Uh, the intention of this meeting is uh, to help support you in uh, reclaiming your power so that you can live the life that you are meant to live, which is a life obviously of empowerment and also expressing divine qualities such as peace, prosperity, harmony, uh, love, health, and wholeness. And uh, that is possible for everybody. That's actually your birthright. And uh, so that's what this is about. And then ultimately, uh, really, this is about self-realization because that's really what I'm talking about when I say all of that. Because the way that I define self-realization, it is to know yourself and that means to know who you are at all levels and to know your powers and to know your relationship with reality. And as I've already expressed, that enables you to live the life that you're meant to live. And truly, you are meant to live that life. So uh, sometimes people have these uh, funny beliefs like life is suffering. I'm just meant to suffer. And uh, if you really take a look more closely at that, which in a sense is what we'll be looking at today together, uh, you'll start to realize that uh, you get to have that belief if you want, but it doesn't make it actually true. It might be true for you as a result, but it's not actually true in the large sense. It's not absolutely true. It's just true for you so long as you believe it. But why would you want to believe that? What good does that actually do for you? Now, uh, as we'll take a look at today, possibly, you might have some reasons why you believe that uh, it's good for you to have those unhelpful beliefs, but those were formed out of ignorance and innocence. And understanding that and then reclaiming your power allows you to let go of those unhelpful beliefs and to, as I have already repeatedly said, step into your authentic power so that you can live the life that you're really meant to live. So I hope that sounds like a good deal for you. If so, then you're in the right place and stick around. And if not, then uh, I guess this is not for you, um, which is totally fine. Uh, there's some something for everybody. And if this is not for you, go find your thing and blessings to you. Uh, so, uh, okay. So now with all that said, uh, let me also just cover a few more of the basics so that we can, I want to make sure that everybody has the, the information, the knowledge that is the essential knowledge that will help you to have success in your life. And um, I know that there's an, an enormous amount of information out there. I don't have to tell you, you know, um, you're probably deeply immersed in it. <laughs> and so you probably know better, far better than I do, actually, uh, just how stressful that can be to try and get all of the knowledge and the information. And uh, the good news is that you don't need to get all of the knowledge and all the information. You just need to get the right knowledge and information and then put it into practice so that you can get the results. And so um, that's really an important thing. Just getting the information, it, it turns out to be overwhelming. There's so much information and you don't need all the information. This is a really important point um, because you think about it. Um, think about a metaphor of a of a mountain and you have a, a goal and I know some people won't resonate with this metaphor but just go with it anyway just imagine that you have a goal of ascending that mountain and reaching the top because you want to have that that view from the top of the mountain now 
in order to do that, you just need one path up the mountain. You don't need all of the paths. You just need one path up the mountain. You could spend a lifetime trying to get all of the information about all of the paths going up the mountain, and you still would not get all of the information. And by the way, you still wouldn't have taken any steps up any of the paths toward your destination. Therefore, you would have not made any actual progress. Uh, and so this is, again, a very important point. If you're just in the business of accumulating knowledge, then you just be honest about that. You're accumulating knowledge, but that knowledge is not actually necessarily helpful to you because you have to be clear about what your actual goal is. And then you just need the knowledge that will help you to progress toward your goal. And you just need to take steps in alignment with that. So again, if you're using this metaphor of the mountain, if your destination, your goal is to arrive at the top of the mountain, you don't need knowledge about the whole mountain. You just need knowledge about one path that will take you there. And just really let that in for a second, because this will be very helpful. I know a lot of people are still in this business of thinking that they just need to get all the information. But it, big an, another um, deception, that is a self-deception, is that a lot of people believe that somehow if they amass all of the information, they're going to be able to assemble that into one path. But again, think about this metaphor of the mountain. You don't need to have, you cannot uh, merge all of the paths into one. It doesn't work like that. You just need one path. And that path will take you there. And if you're trying to do the impossible, then you just frustrate yourself needlessly. So please understand that the, there is there is a truth of oneness that in, in this metaphor, that truth of oneness is realized at the peak of the mountain. In order to arrive there, you need to take a path, not all the paths, not all the paths merged into one. You just need one path. <laughs> Uh, and so my aim here is to give you a path and to try and keep that as simple as possible so that you can take action on it. Because again, the knowledge in and of itself is not going to give you the results. You have to have, of course, you need to have the right knowledge that's necessary for you, but you then need to take action on it because the knowledge by itself never did anything for anybody. It's the knowledge plus the action. So my aim is to give you just the knowledge that is necessary so that you can take the action, keep it as simple as possible so that you can get the results, so that you can, as I've said, step into your authentic power and live the life that you're meant to live instead of struggling. So hopefully it still sounds like a good deal to you. Now, um, to that end, I wanna just outline some of the basic information that can be very helpful to you because again, there's so much information out there and some of it seems to be in conflict with others. And then sometimes the information seems to be very similar. And so it's very possible then to overcomplicate things and think that, oh no, I've got to do so many things. You know, I have to understand this principle and that principle, and I've got to do these 10,000 practices and it's going to take me, you know, that that's like 45 hours per day of stuff that I've got to do. And I don't even understand all of it. And I'm not able to do most of it. So it's really easy to fall into overwhelm and then become paralyzed and not get anywhere. Um, so I want also to emphasize that you don't need all of the stuff. It doesn't need to be so complicated. You can let go of so many of the complications. Don't be uh, wasting your time striving for the absolute perfect techniques and then arguing with yourself about whether you've got the right technique or the perfect technique and maybe there's some other technique or some other information that would be better or more perfect because then you're not taking action. Whereas uh, what I'm proposing to you here or what I'm about to propose to you is absolutely, it absolutely works and it's simple. And so you don't have to make it more complicated than this. So you want, you have certain desires Okay, these desires, uh, in some traditions, desire is viewed as the enemy. Desire is viewed as the obstacle to the true realization. Okay, so if you want to know yourself as peace, as harmony, as abundance, as freedom, then in some traditions, then the desires are viewed as the obstacle to that because you already are that. And that's always true. You already are that. So you're never going to attain any of those things through any outer 
uh, achievements. You cannot get to what you already are. So you'll never earn it. You'll never achieve it. It already is the truth. And so uh, on those in those traditions, then it, it's quite sensible that desire is viewed as the obstacle because obviously if desire is is drawing your attention to some something uh, and that's likely going to be away from the actual source of the fulfillment, which is within you, who you already are. Um, and so that's very interesting and all. But the problem is it's not particularly practical for most people. And so I emphasize this a lot, which is the importance of knowing who you are so that you can recognize your path. So if you're the sort of person who can just uh, let go of all desire and you can succeed in that, uh, then good for you. And in which case, you don't need m most of what I have to say. So you would actually be better off <laughs> just to sit in your own fulfillment now rather than listening to anything I have to say or anything that anybody else has to say. But... Um, if that's not you, then it's really good for you to recognize that and acknowledge that you have desires which you which you're not ready to just let go of, and that you actually where there's something for you to learn there, and that you're going to learn that through some kind of expression or manifestation. So that's an important distinction to be able to make, uh, because it it's going to help you to be on the right path, because if you're on the wrong path, you won't succeed. If you're on the right path meaning the right path for you. And I'm just talking about this fundamental distinction just between two fundamental groupings of paths. One is that you can be on a path of um, of attainment or you can be on a path of renunciation. And if you're on the path of renunciation, it means that you're renouncing. Uh, and since you're using Zoom or YouTube, uh, then you're not renouncing. Yes, <laughs> at least not yet. So it would be good for you then to acknowledge that your path most likely is one of attainment. So they're not totally distinct. There's overlap, but it's important to understand that on this path of attainment, there are certain attainments that need to be uh, attained, meaning that you, you need to learn certain lessons by doing, by achieving, by taking action, by manifesting. Uh, and so given that that's the case, then you want to actually develop the skills for your path. So the path of the renunciate involves going and sitting in a cave in the Himalayas or something, the equivalent of that, and giving up all desire and giving up all attachment. And the path of the one who's interested in attainment is, is not ultimately, the it leads to the same place. So there ultimately is a, re a release of the attachment. There still is ultimately a release of uh, the desire, but it's through a different means. It's through the fulfillment. It's through the attainment. And so if that's your path, then you want to have that necessary knowledge that will allow you to succeed in that. And that's what I aim to give you here. So, and here I'm just, this is just preliminaries before we get to the meat and potatoes of the, uh, of the talk today. But I just want to make sure that this is clear to people so that there's proper context. So uh, given that you have a desire for attainment, then there's some important things to be able to do. Uh, number one, you have to figure out what it is you want to attain. So you have to know what you want. And uh, this is so very important. And yet uh, so many people skip this step. And if you skip this step, your likelihood of success drops to near zero. It's not entirely zero because there's always a possibility of uh, you know, divine intervention that could, <laughs> could produce the fulfillment without you even knowing what it is that you want. But that likelihood is pretty small in the big picture. So you're much better off actually taking this step and getting clarity about what you want. And so this involves, number one, uh, releasing all desires that are not actually authentically yours, and then really honing in on those desires that are authentically yours. And so um, this is an important distinction to make because we are, we've got an awful lot of desires. You know, I mean, all day long, you've got desire after desire after desire after desire. And if you have to uh, fulfill all of those, that's slow going. 
right? Like if every time the uh, an idea for, uh, you know, a gourmet meal pops into your head, if you have to fulfill that, then that's going to really slow down your, your progress on your path toward your ultimate goal, which is peace, uh, freedom, happiness, you know, unconditional, unconditional peace, freedom, and happiness, right? So um, it really will slow it down if you feel compelled to fulfill or manifest every single desire that you have, because you already have a tremendous amount of desires that are that you've accumulated within you. Plus, uh, out to out there, there's an unending stream of desires that are just ready to be pumped into you. I mean, it, especially if you're using any kind of media at all, right? If you if you go out in the world, if you have relationships, then there's an unending stream of desires that are just waiting to be fed to you. So uh, it's really important that you learn to distinguish between those desires that are authentically yours and those that are not. And then you can simply let go of those desires that are not authentically yours. Why? Because they're not yours. So you only have to fulfill those desires that are actually yours. Meaning in this case, I'm using the word fulfillment to mean to actually uh, manifest them. Those are the only ones that you actually have to manifest. You do not have to manifest those that are not authentically yours. So it's, and the good news is that 99.9% .9 of the desires are not yours. It's like, uh, you know, you, you came into this life and you had your, you know, your handful of authentic desires. And then the next thing you know, because you're at this bizarre, you know, B-A-Z-A-A-R, bizarre, not the other kind of bizarre. Oh, this kind of bizarre too, but the bizarre, bizarre B-A-Z-A-A-R of this world and this life. There, you know, vendors everywhere hawking their goods, their desires, and like, you know, come have a desire, have a desire, have a desire, and you start taking on all the desires, and the next thing you know, you've forgotten what you were here for. And so you just got this big burden of desires that you're trying to deal with now. So you need to for your own well-being, it's helpful to learn to distinguish from those desires that are authentically yours versus those that are not. And uh, just to keep it simple, one way that I have discovered that I think, I say discovered, not like I'm taking credit for being the one that discovered. I mean, I discovered it for myself. I didn't discover it in, in the world. Others have also had this realization, but I had a personal discovery of the incredible value of a simple approach, which is just to find out what hurts the most. And uh, those that's a really good indication as to the things that are, it points to the authentic desires. So meaning that if, the, if there's this thing, this recurring, this recurrent pain of, uh, you know, I just can't seem to get my health right. And my health is really bothering me every day. It's just weighing on me. Why am I not? Why is my health not right? Why is my not health not right? If only my health was better, then I would finally be happy. What's wrong with my health? If that kind of fixation is there and it's really hurting, then good news. It's pointing to an authentic desire, which is I have an authentic desire to to have true health, to know the the truth of health for myself embodied to experience that, to know that. Uh, if the thing that is this recurrent stress and struggle in my life that's really hurting me is uh, I have this sense of lack of material lack. I don't have enough. I don't know how to get enough. I don't, you know, I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. I'm stressing about it. I never seem to be able to get enough. Well, good news. Then it's, letting me know that one of my authentic desires in this lifetime is to actually have true knowledge of abundance and prosperity. Okay. And so there's only, it turns out there's only a handful of these things when you really get down to it. Um, it's come down to health, uh, abundance and, uh, and relationship really kind of, that's kind of what it comes down to. I mean, there's the, and then at the, the larger goal, the larger desire is to know yourself, but, um, but fundamentally it kind of comes down to these three things. Now that might along the way for people that might show up in different ways. So you can't just, um, skip ahead. You have to actually 
pursue your own personal path, which is going to, which means you have to explore how those desires are manifesting in your life. But as you start to really focus on them, you'll eventually for yourself, you'll gain that clarity of what it really is at a higher level. Um, so anything else that's not hurting, anything else that you can easily let go of, uh, just let go of it. You know, if, and I use this example of the Lamborghini or the Ferrari, the, the, the expensive car. Um, and just as a placeholder, just to, you know, to represent the, the, the desires that are not yours. And then some people have actually told me that that that's their actual desire. They really, they've investigated it and for real, they want the Lamborghini. Um, that's fine. But just, I'm going to use that example now. Most, because most people don't actually authentically want the Lamborghini, but, and, and most people don't even think they want the Lamborghini, but there are some people who think they want the Lamborghini or they think they want the, the fancy house, or they think they want the, um, whatever the, the things, the, the, the thing, kinds of things that people often think they want, you know, the, the new gadgets, the new, uh, entertainment, the new, the, the thing that will give them a sense of prestige or power or whatever. And, um, it, most of those things, if you just practice letting go with regard to them, you'll learn that you can simply let them go, that you never really actually wanted them, that they were, they were just given to you by somebody else that you picked them up from your parents or from your teachers or from your spouse or from your children or from Facebook or whatever it might be. Uh, so hopefully I'm giving you the short version, but hopefully all of that is relatively clear and not muddying things too much, but basically you want to get clear on what you want. That's what I'm getting to. Right. Um, and, and you should be able to narrow that down to one, two or three things that are actually things that you in any given moment that you really truly desire. Okay. And so again, in, at, at any given moment, those, it, it might manifest for you as something a little bit more specific, like, um, Ultimately, let's say taking a look at relationship, ultimately the desire is to is the relationship with oneself, right? It's the desire to be um to, to know self-love, to have peace with yourself, to to um be to be happy within yourself. Okay, so that is ultimately the desire there. But um along the way, as I say, you can't really shortcut it if that's showing up for you in the moment in terms of getting right in relationship with a particular person, then so be it. I mean, that's just the truth for you. And that's leading you to that higher level uh, truth, but you can't shortcut that. So you've got to take the steps where you are. Um, and so hopefully that's clear along the way, there will be, it will show up initially more specifically. And then as you take the steps, it will become more and more refined and you will start to move progressively closer to the more refined versions of those desires, but you have to take the steps where you are. Um, that's the point, but get clear on what those things are that you want and write them down. And like I say, there's only, there should only be a handful of them at any given time. If you've got 10 different desires that you think that you, they're all high priority and you need to manifest all of those right now, um, then you're, you're, you're deceiving yourself and you're just going to, block yourself from actually making any progress because there's this law of attention. Whatever you put your attention on, that's where the energy goes. And so if you divide your energy among 10 different things, then in, in practice, in reality, the way that works is that you don't make any progress on any of them. It's, it's, it's much worse than just getting one tenth of the energy per, per thing. You, you dilute your energy so much once you are, um, putting it on that many things that you don't make any progress on anything. In fact, you just confuse yourself more and make things more difficult for you in your life. And you experience a lot of stress that way. So it's really important that you can get clear enough on what actually matters. And it should be really, if it's more than three things, then it's very suspicious. And also it's going to make it difficult for you to uh, actually have good results with that. So do your best to get clear on what are the top one, two, or maybe three things, desires that you have right now that you really want to um, 
manifest and have have the complete knowledge and and uh, confidence in regard to these things, they should be uh, expressed in a positive and present tense. And this is also a really important point because a lot of the time people make this mistake of focusing on what they don't want. You know, I uh, like if if it's a relationship thing, it's like I I don't want uh, arguments. I don't want conflict. I don't want fighting. <laughs> I, do, I don't want disrespect. Well, uh, that's not what you want. That's what you don't want. And if, even if you phrase it in terms of, I don't want it, what you're actually doing, remember this law of attention, you're putting your attention on that, which you don't want. You can negate it all you want, but your attention is still going to the thing you don't want. You're orienting in terms of what you don't want which means all the energy goes to that. And lo and behold, you get more of that in your life. And so, because the law just works that way. So uh, it's really important to get clear on what you actually want, not what you don't want. And oftentimes this is challenging at first because all we've known is what we don't want. We've just focused day in and day out, year after year on what we don't want, which Therefore, it should come as no surprise that we get exactly what we don't want over and over and over and over and over. But having this realization should come as very good news because it means now you can start to use your power intelligently, but you have to focus on what you do want independent of what you don't want. So instead of I don't, instead of I, I want relationship without disrespect or I don't want disrespect, uh, be clear about what it is you do want. And the, the, the difficulty here is that if you just play with the words and you just say, well, then obviously what I want is respect. It's not always so simple as that. I mean, that's a good step is to say, I, I, I now experience respectful, healthy relationships. But that word, if you're just, sometimes if you're just reversing or inverting what you don't want, it's still going to trigger in you a reference to what you don't want. You're still thinking in terms of, I I don't want the disrespect. So I want respectful relationships really just becomes um, in, translated in your mind as I want to, I want, I don't want, I don't want disrespect. So again, your energy is still going to what you don't want. And the thing is, if you think about this, um, if, you, if you're having, so you can ask yourself this, if I have this so-called respectful, healthy relationship, then am I really thinking about it in terms of it being respectful? Is that even on my mind? And it should become clear that it's not. When you attain what you desire, you're no longer thinking in terms of respect because you only think in terms of respect when you think that you're not getting respect. So uh, so you need to actually put yourself into the state that you desire and imagine what that might be like. Think from there. What is my experience when, I'm, when, I, when I have attained that? Am I actually thinking about respect at all? And it actually should not be on your mind at all because you've, because you're complete and happy within yourself. So um, you need to start thinking about it that way. And you'll know that you've succeeded when you can actually attain the state, the desired state in your imagination without any reference to the, to the old state. Okay, so hopefully you can see how important this is. If you don't do this step, then it's gonna be very difficult for you to achieve success and you're really fooling yourself. You you can't do anything to achieve success if you don't take this step. So get clarity on what you want, number one thing, and write it down. <clears throat> it's amazing to me how many people still don't write it down. I, I say it's amazing. I mean, it's amazing because, you know, I, I, I also sometimes don't write things down. So I'm not like pointing my finger and saying, well, I, I am now, but I wasn't pointing my finger and saying, you know, I can't believe you're not writing things down. It's like, I, I also don't, but I mean, sometimes I don't, but, but just hear me that if you take that step and write it down, it will, it's a huge step. It's a small action, but a huge step. So do yourself that favor and actually write down what you want and write it down in present tense in a positive sense. Then read that each day. Why? Because if you do that, you're putting your attention on it. And guess what? That law of attention is there. So if you're putting your attention on it, your energy goes to it. And if you're regular with that, if you do that every day, what starts to happen is it starts to become a habit. And you'll notice, and it doesn't take that long in a relatively short amount of time, as long as you're consistent about doing that every day, 
you'll start to notice that you'll catch yourself in the act when you're working against in your own mind and in your own imagination, working against your actual desired outcome. And then you'll automatically put your attention on what you want, right? So what I mean by this is, so if you say, okay, I, you say, I'm struggling with relationships where I feel disrespected. And so you have to get clear. Okay. What is it I want? Well, I, I okay. I, um, I, I'm so grateful that now I love myself and I'm surrounded by harmonious relationships that reflect that. Okay. Something like that. So you read that each day and then it might not happen at first, but after a couple of days or a couple of weeks, you should start to, you'll, you will likely notice that what's going to happen is that you'll catch yourself in the act as you're thinking the old way. You'll, you'll catch yourself thinking, I can't believe they're disrespecting me again. And you'll be like, oh, oh, what is it I want? I'm so grateful that I'm, that I love myself and I'm experiencing that reflected to me in harmonious relationships. Okay. That's it. You just do that. And that's half of it. Uh, that's a third of it. Okay. So, but it's, it's, I've, I've got, you know, it's 38 minutes in now. So I got to go a little faster if I'm going to get to the meat and potatoes, I guess. Okay. So <clears throat> do that. Now, um, the other part is uh, the other two thirds. So the, the next third is that, um, it's very, very, very helpful. This part is not absolutely required, but boy, is it going to make things a lot faster and, and easier. So I highly recommend it. Highly, highly, highly recommend it. Uh, that you take some time each day to train yourself to uh, reset to zero, to let go completely, to let go of all of the identification, to let go of all the gripping, to let go of all of the clinging, to let go of all of the stressing. You actually want to train yourself that you have that power, that it's actually possible for you to do that. Why? Because you're none of that stuff. And that's part of the power of it is that you're training yourself that you're none of that stuff. Whereas most of us are accustomed to identifying with that stuff. We're accustomed to identifying with the story, with the stress, with the all of the, the clinging and all the rest of it, all the attachment. And so it really clouds things because uh, you're, you can't really see, you obviously can't see clearly if you're clinging, if you're attached to certain outcomes and certain identities, uh, it lim greatly limits what you can see and perceive. And so um, training yourself that you can let go and that you can just temporarily, that you can release all that identification, all that gripping, all that clinging, all of that uh, attachment, I probably already said that, all that identification, just training yourself that that's possible for you is very powerful. And so I also highly recommend that. And um, I guess just to make it clear what I'm talking about, uh, I'll, I'll guide you briefly through that. I do wanna make it clear that I'm gonna guide you through that uh, it will be, it'll take a few minutes to do that. And so there's a little bit of a process there, but once you've trained yourself in this, then it should be like that. You can just like quicker than snapping your fingers. You can just learn to drop it. Uh, and so that's really the goal. The goal is not to perfect a, uh, meditation, the meditation, if you want to call it that the process, the technique is a technique that is to help you, to train you, to realize that you already are that freedom. You already are that, uh, which is beyond all of the story and the identification so that you can have that clear view so that you can open yourself to immense possibilities. So just don't, don't get hung up on any particular technique. There are many different techniques, but um, ultimately from my perspective, the techniques are useful to continue to work with to just train yourself, but it's not about getting perfect at the technique. It's about the outcome. 
And so you really want to help yourself to realize that you have the ability to drop it completely all, at least for a moment, anytime. Okay, so just so that it can be hopefully clear to you, uh, if you're interested, then I invite you to close your eyes. And obviously only if it's safe for you to do so. If you're driving, please don't close your eyes. Um, and if it's comfortable, if it's not comfortable, obviously you needn't close your eyes. But if it's comfortable and safe for you to do so, close the eyes. And the purpose of closing the eyes is just to reduce the stimulation, the visual stimulation, the noise happening in the nervous system. That's it. So that there doesn't need to be any great mystery about that. It's just to reduce that excessive stimulation, quiet things down a little bit. So it will make it a little easier. It's not required. You don't have to close your eyes to be yourself. You don't have to close your eyes to release attachment. But just for training purposes, it can be helpful. So now with your eyes closed, then you can just notice what else is going on. Okay, so we've reduced the visual stimulation. And uh, so everybody's a little different. For some people, there might be uh, you know, like olfactory stimulation might be high for some people. If that's the case, then um, you can give a little bit of attention to that and go through the same kind of process with that that I'll guide you through with other stuff. But for most of us, most of the time, um, the next big thing is the... Uh, mental stimulation. So after the visual, then the next thing that requires a lot of processing is usually the mental or um, sometimes the uh, the um, the felt sense. But we'll we'll go through each of those, starting with the mental stuff. So you can just notice that there are thoughts that are happening. And so you can be aware that thoughts have a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? They appear and they exist and then they disappear. So they're not here all the time. They come into existence, they remain, and then they go out. And so just be aware of that. Just notice that that's the nature of thought. And you can notice that the thought is coming and going in the space of awareness that you are right? You are aware of the thoughts. So you might like the thoughts. You might not like the thoughts. You might wish that there were fewer thoughts. You might wish there were more pleasant thoughts. Whatever the case might be, uh, you can still notice that whatever thoughts are happening are happening in this space of awareness that you are. So for our purposes here, it doesn't matter whether there are thoughts or no thoughts, whether there are quiet thoughts or loud thoughts, whether the thoughts are pleasant or unpleasant or any of the rest of it. We're just noticing that the thoughts exist in the space of awareness. So actually, none of these thoughts can possibly be any problem for the space of awareness. They're just coming and going in the space of awareness, just the same as clouds moving in the sky. So the clouds do not disturb the sky. The thoughts do not disturb the awareness. So we're just noticing that. And then next we can turn to the felt sense. So there are sensations happening. And some of those sensations are interpreted as uh, bodily sensations and some are interpreted as feelings and some are interpreted as emotions and all kinds of distinctions might be made. But ultimately we could just say they're all felt sense, there's some feeling occurring. And uh, so you can also notice that these feelings, these, we'll call them feelings, just as a general term, all these feelings or sensations are also like thoughts. They have a beginning, a middle, and an end. So they're coming and going. And they have their existence in the same space of awareness. So just like thoughts, uh, we might have preferences regarding our feelings. We might prefer that we had fewer feelings or nicer feelings or all kinds of different preferences there. But for our purposes here, we're just noticing that the feelings uh, actually do not in any way disturb the space of awareness. So it doesn't matter whether there are lots of feelings or not many feelings or whether they're nice feelings or not nice feelings, big feelings, small feelings. 
regardless of any of that, the space of awareness is undisturbed by the feelings. So feelings, thoughts, visual uh, content. Okay, so auditory content, same thing. So just notice that the all sounds are coming and going in the space of awareness. And the same with all the other senses. So smells, tastes, all the other things are coming and going in this space of awareness. And the space of awareness remains undisturbed, unaffected by all of the comings and goings of all the rest of the stuff. So then you can just notice that there may be habits of attachment or gripping or avoidance regarding the content that's appearing and disappearing in the space of awareness. And that's fine. So of course we might have preferences. We might say, oh, it'd be so nice if that didn't happen, if I didn't have that attachment or I didn't grip or I didn't avoid, I didn't react in these ways, that would be so nice. And that may be true or it might not be true, but for our purposes now, uh, it doesn't really matter. We're just noticing that also that is all occurring in the space of awareness. So the gripping, the attachment, uh, identification, all the rest of that stuff is also happening in the space of awareness. And so still the space of awareness remains undisturbed regardless of any attachment, identification, gripping, avoidance, or any of the rest of it. And so just for an instant right now, just notice that you already are the space of awareness. So just make that, just it's a, just a sort of subtle shift. Just notice that you already are this space of awareness, that everything is coming and going in you. You don't have to do anything to be this space of awareness. You just are this space of awareness. So this is the, this is what is your fundamental continuous truth of who you are is this space of awareness. Everything else comes and goes. You are this space of awareness eternally, continuously, and effortlessly. So you don't have to do anything to achieve it. It's just given. You are this. It's inalienable. So just notice that. That's it. Just notice that and notice how easy that is. And notice that you can uh, then just try this out just for a moment. Just again, put your attention on the thoughts. Just notice thoughts, notice the sensations, and then again, just notice this space of awareness. And one more time, put your attention on the thoughts, sensations, whatever content might be here, just notice that, observe that, and then one more time, just allow your attention to rest on the awareness, this open awareness that's here. You don't have to do anything with it. You don't have to get it. You don't have to hold on to it. You don't have to achieve anything. Just notice it just for one instant, just rest. Uh, so there's no hurry to transition to an open-eyed state, but whenever you are ready to do so, please do it slowly so that you don't uh, shock yourself with that sudden burst of stimulation. So just slowly, when you are ready, slowly open the eyes so that you can remain continuously aware of yourself as that open awareness. And just notice that all of the visual field is occurring in that space of awareness. Okay. So... That was a relatively quick exploration uh, that is intended just to give you that recognition, that reset, so you can just notice that this open awareness, this spaciousness, this freedom is always here. It doesn't come and go. It's absolutely reliable. You don't have to do anything for it. And it has to be who you are because it's the only thing that's continuous and you are continuous. 
So you can't be the thoughts because the thoughts come and go. And you can't be the sensations because the sensations come and go. You can't be any of that content because it comes and goes. You're that which is here continuously. And it's effortless. So you, you cannot get it or nor lose it. It's just a given. You are that. Uh, recognizing that. Just taking a moment to just notice that, to acknowledge that, to actually have a glimpse of that on a regular basis daily is very, very helpful. Uh, whatever process works for you to achieve that, make use of that. Understand that it's just a technique, whatever you use, but any technique that is supportive of you, of you um, having that glimpse is very helpful because as I've said, it will uh, open you up to a much bigger perspective that will allow you to let go of a lot of unnecessary limitations. So now I've given myself very little time for the meat and potatoes of the talk, but let's see what we can do. So the next part is, um, so in order to, uh, in order to uh, attain your desired outcome, Obviously, it's very, very important that you can put your attention on it. And that requires that you have some clarity of what it is. So those two things go together. You practice putting your attention on it, you'll get more clarity about what it is. The more clarity you get about it, the more you can put your attention on it. It becomes a virtuous cycle. And that's part of the creative process. So how do things get created? That's, a, that's it. You put your attention on it consistently. The energy goes there. It grows. It becomes more and more real for you. So that's why I say that's the most important thing. Uh, however, in that process, what will happen, and it will happen sooner or later, is that you will encounter some kind of resistance. And uh, if it happens, sometimes this happens very quickly in the process, so much so that it seems impossible to put any attention at all on the desired outcome because it doesn't seem possible to imagine it at all. And when that happens, it's a very good indication that you have an enormous amount of resistance, <laughs> which it means that you have assigned so much meaning in your life that is opposed to your desired outcome that you cannot, it's like a, a, a giant solid wall. It's like the you know, Great Wall of China. You cannot seem, you cannot see through it. You cannot get over it. You cannot go around it. You're just confronted with that, no matter what you do. Uh, and that can seem intimidating and uh, difficult, but know this. Know that what what that indicates is that you definitely need to release a lot of that unhelpful meaning that you have assigned in your life. And I'm going to walk you through that process now. I think we'll go a little bit over on the talk uh, in terms of time, just in order to do any kind of, uh, in order to do service to this, to this topic. But um, even, so even if you can imagine your desired outcome, to some extent, there, there necessarily still has to be some resistance. Because if there wasn't, then just putting your attention on it would mean that it would become manifest instantly, actually, is if there was no resistance. And so sooner or later, you will encounter some resistance. And that resistance will show up in, in this way. So as you're imagining your desired outcome, you, you want to feel as though it's totally natural and real, just as though you're remembering something that happened yesterday. So if you think about something that happened yesterday, if you think about maybe what you ate for dinner yesterday or something like that, then there should be no resistance to that because you accept that it's real and true. And so it feels totally natural to you. You just think, yeah, that happened. I ate that. I was there. That's That definitely happened. It's real. Um, so you don't have to have some amazing, fantastic, over-the-top feeling about it. You just want to have a feeling that it's natural and real, that it really is true, just as though you're imagining or remembering what happened yesterday. So when you're putting your attention and imagining your desired outcome, uh, when you encounter resistance to that feeling of naturalness and reality to it, then pay attention to that because then what you're encountering is that which needs to be released. 
because once you've released that and you've sufficiently clarified in your imagination what it is that you truly desire, then it has to happen on all levels, including at the, what we would consider to be an external level. So um, now, so hopefully that's clear. So you want, and it, why this intermediate step of this uh, reset to zero, this reset to yourself as open awareness, that which is continuous and eternal. Because, like I said, if you don't, then you're clinging to a lot of identification, which makes it really much more challenging for you to let go of resistance because you won't even be able to see most of it. Uh, whereas if you reset to zero, if you can just have this momentary letting go of all of the identification, all this stuff, you don't have to sustain it just for a moment, just to be able to let go and recognize that you are truly free. Uh, will allow you to be able to see more clearly what it is that you have been uh, clinging to, the resistance, the limitation that you've been identified with. So, uh, so then when you're imagining your desired outcome, just pay attention and notice what it is that you're believing that's interfering with your desired outcome. And if, and so I often suggest, and I'll suggest it now, make a list of those things. So let's say, you know, I close my eyes and just for a moment, I, I imagine, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm living abundance. Uh, I'm experiencing that peace and prosperity and confidence, doing what I desire, very happy. Uh, and then, and then I say, yeah, you know, I've doesn't seem totally natural and real. It's not like I'm remembering what happened yesterday. So pay attention. My mind might say, uh, 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 you, you can't have that because in order to uh, in order to achieve that, you have to. Uh, you have to uh, s sell your soul to to uh, you know some corporate entity. I don't know. You know, it might just be a belief, and and I'm not willing to do that. So therefore, I can't have it. So, and and that's just one example. There will be dozens or hundreds of of these kinds of beliefs. So then, good news. Now. I'm conscious of it, which means that I can release it. Before it was there, but I wasn't conscious of it, which meant meant it was very difficult for me to release it. So I should write that down. So write down the limiting beliefs that you encounter when you're imagining your desired outcome. Now, some people say, oh, I don't want to do that because if I write it down, it's giving it power. They'll say, Joey, didn't you just say about the, the law of attention? If I put my attention on it, the energy goes there. True. But guess what? You've been putting your attention on it just unconsciously. And as long as you keep doing that, which you will until you release it, then it's going to keep getting your energy. So writing it down is not going to give it more power than it already has. You're already giving it tremendous power. Writing it down is just going to make it conscious so then you can release it. So don't be afraid of writing it down. Writing it down is not going to hurt you. Writing it down is only going to help you because then you can become conscious of it so you can release it. So have absolute uh, confidence that it will not hurt you. You are absolutely safe. Just write it down so you can release it. Now, as you do this, you're coming up with a, a list of your limiting beliefs. You don't have to do this all in one sitting. You're going to, you're going to add to this as you encounter other limiting beliefs that you have. You're unlikely to encounter all the limiting beliefs in five minutes. So don't waste your time trying to do that. Just write down whatever limiting beliefs you encounter as you do the exercise of putting your attention on what you want on your desired outcome. And do that each day. So each day you might encounter other limiting beliefs that you'll then add to your list. Hopefully that's clear. Now, notice that your limiting beliefs are actually, they actually consist of meaning. Okay. It's all just meaning. Now, what is is there actual meaning inherent in anything in this in this life? And oftentimes people believe there is meaning inherent in, in things in life. But actually, there is no meaning inherent in anything in life. 
a meaning is something that we assign to our experiences. We make up the meaning and assign it. I remember uh, having a, a very, it was a very distinct experience where I was kind of shocked into having this realization on some level. Uh, it was maybe, it was more than 20 years ago. I was at a, um, a, an event organized by, uh, by Byron Katie's organization. And it was a relatively small event. I mean, in terms of the number of people, uh, I'm, by small, I, I'm, I would say somewhere between 50 and hundred people were in that room. And so it was somewhat intimate. It wasn't like a big auditorium or anything like that. It was a, it was not a huge room. And, uh, and so it had a, a sense of intimacy to it. And I remember, uh, one woman in particular who got up to do the work with Byron Katie and this woman, her story about her experience, about who she was, was this, uh, you know, these, these things that happened to her in her childhood, which, uh, I had a story for myself that those things that, 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 that woman experienced as a child were, uh, things that left permanent scars that were unhealable and, uh, that that was unfortunate, <laughs> but that that woman was going to be stuck with that forever. That I, I actually believe that. I remember having that belief. I remember sitting in that room and just thinking, having the sinking feeling of, oh boy, I really feel bad for this woman because that sucks that she's had these experiences. She'll never be okay. And uh, I remember being shocked by the fact that Byron Katie did not have, uh, was non not phased by this at all. I mean, she did not bat an eye. There was nothing. I'd... She just proceeded with the work and investigated this with the woman. And in a relatively short amount of time, and, and I remember the woman, and this is all my memory, of course, but I remember her being very upset, you know, she, very emotional as she was telling the story of what happened um, and crying and all this. And as they did the work, well, by, by the time they had completed the work, I remember again, this shock of, it was very clear and it was palpable. I could feel it, that the whole energy of the whole room had shifted. It had actually been released, not just, not just for this woman, but for everybody, including me. It was really, like I say, shocking. Um, and so that woman was not scarred. There, was, there were things that happened in her childhood and that was it. And the meaning that she had assigned to those things that had happened to her in her childhood had been the source of all of her pain. And once that meaning was, once she no longer assigned that meaning, then she was free. And uh, that was, as I say, it was a very, it, that experience b stood out for me very much. It was the first moment that I can recall where I, was really uh, where I had that kind of experience where I realized on a on a direct level, not just intellectually, but I actually had a direct experience that uh, meaning is not intrinsic to events or circumstances or anything else. But the meaning is something that we assign. And so these beliefs that you write down, that you encounter as you're doing this work for yourself, as you focus on put your attention on your desired outcome. You write down these limiting beliefs. And what I'm telling you is that these beliefs are actually just meaning that you assign based on experiences that you had. So you had experiences as we all did, and you assigned meaning to those experiences. That meaning did not exist in those experiences. It's absolutely impossible that that meaning would ex would exist in those experiences. Um, so, and, and we do this, you know. So, think about. Very few people don't have the beliefs like, uh, "I'm not good enough," uh, "I'm I'm uh, I'm not worthy," uh, things like that. Okay, so let's just go with those. So, I'm not good enough, and I'm unworthy. So, so many people are struggling with these beliefs. And they believe that that's just the truth. And they believe that they have evidence of that truth because they've had experiences that for them 
prove that that's so. Now, on an intellectual level as an adult, of course, many of us might say, well, I know intellectually that I'm worthy. I know that I've, you know, I know I am good enough because I've accomplished many things in my life. You know, I might be a very high achiever. I might have done so many things. I'm doing so many things successfully every day. But underneath it all, I have this belief that I'm not good enough. And it causes all kinds of suffering in my life. So th that belief was formed because that meaning was assigned to some experiences in usually in very early childhood where the experiences did not have that meaning intrinsically, but we I projected that meaning. And then because that was not challenged and that continued to be coupled in that way, that the meaning was inherent in the experiences, then that belief remains because that's all the belief is. The belief is just that coupling of the of the um the the meaning or the thought with the experience. The experience consists primarily of the images and the feelings. There of course there are other components of for some people, some of those other components will be more strongly emphasized, like the smell or the taste or things like that, uh, or the sound. But for most of us, most of the time, it's the it's the um, the images and the feeling. And of the two, it's the feeling that's usually the strongest. If you don't have the feeling, then you don't, It's I, I would say it's impossible to have a belief without a feeling. If you don't feel it, you don't believe it. Um, but oftentimes the visual component is significant because we believe that we saw that those things were true. We believe that we saw evidence that I'm not good enough. But if you take a look and actually review what actually happened in your life, if you if you kind of go through those events, those experiences that you've had that you believe are evidence that you're not good enough or whatever the belief is, you'll see that what's actually there is just that you had there was some there was some experience. That experience consisted of somebody doing something, somebody saying something, some some you saw something, you felt something, you heard something. And that, those are the facts. That's what actually happened. And nowhere in that is there the meaning that you assigned to it. The meaning was something that you overlaid onto it. And it's important to understand that that meaning was something that you overlaid as a, uh, a, a strategy for your own survival, for your own well-being. And you did it to as anybody else would have in given those circumstances and in those conditions, right? So a lot of the time, these were meanings that we assigned when we were very young, and if you think about it, you know, let's take a, a five-year-old. Okay, is a five-year-old particularly resourceful? No, right? I mean, a five-year-old cannot cannot fend for themselves. So if mom and dad are are uh, are 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 appearing scary or angry or upset or whatever the case may be, then it's perfectly logical and reasonable that the five-year-old would feel afraid and draw the conclusion: this must mean that I'm not worthy or whatever it is whatever conclusion was drawn. As, a, as our adult self, we would maybe not draw the same conclusion because we're not, we're more resourceful, right? So if mom and dad are upset and angry now without the conditioning, without the belief, then we would probably be able to just see that and, and realize, yeah, mom and dad are upset. People get upset. It has nothing to do with me. It doesn't mean anything about me. But as a five-year-old, we might perceive, you know, holy cow. And it wouldn't happen consciously, but on an unconscious level, the calculation would be there. It's like, well, you know, I depend on mom and dad. If mom and dad don't feed me, I'm going to die. And if they're angry, that might mean that they're not going to feed me. Like they might abandon me. Therefore, I might die. So I need to figure this out. I need to have, I need to have some meaning that's going to help me to somehow feel safe. And the meaning that we come up with is some kind of survival strategy. And whatever that is, it might seem crazy now, but it made absolute sense then. But the point is that we've still been running those same programs based on those meanings. And the, we think that those meanings are inherent in the events thing, and the things that we experience. And we've been repeating that over and over and over. So that you, I'm sure you notice that those beliefs pop up when you're under stress, right? So you experience some stressful event and then there that belief comes and it says, I'm not good enough. Nothing ever works out for me. I'm not smart enough. I'm too stupid to succeed. Or I'm, you know, I'm ugly. 
or whatever it is, whatever the beliefs are, those they pop up in those times of stress. It's the meaning that's been rehearsed over and over and over. That's been we've we've taught ourselves to see it in so many events and experiences in our lives. So we believe it's true. But if you just go through and take a look and see that that meaning was never actually inherent in any of the things, that in and of itself can be enormously liberating. Then you can take the next step, which is that you can just help yourself to update your younger self. So this is another important point to remember. Think about this. So many of us cling to memories uh, and as though they're the truth. But a lot of the time, the things that we're clinging to are painful to us. We hold on to those things in order to continue to maintain the same patterns that hurt us, that limit us. And so as long as you continue to hold on to those same memories in the same way, if you don't allow that to change, then you're effectively just saying, I want to continue to hold on to the same meaning, the same, therefore the same belief, and therefore the same patterns in my life that ensure that I will not change. So please understand that. If you insist that you have to hold on to exactly the same memories in exactly the same way, then you're saying, I, I'm holding, I want to hold on to the same meaning, the same belief, and therefore I am ensuring that I will not change. So if you do that, then you can do this first step of putting your attention on what you want, all you want, and yet you'll keep yourself blocked from actually having success with the desired outcome. You will sabotage yourself over and 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 over. However, once you do this step that I'm proposing now, where you write down all the limiting beliefs that you encounter, and then you inquire into them, and there are many techniques, but this is a simple approach that I'm proposing to you, where you just take a look and you see, okay, how did I form this belief? And, and the, sometimes you'll actually have memories. And sometimes, a lot of the time, these things happen, you, don't even, you can't even remember. They happened when you were two years old, three years old, four years old. And it's usually not just one event, right? It's a, it's a pattern of events. It's like, it, it, it seems kind of cliche, but it's just true. Most of this stuff came from mom and dad. And it's not because mom and dad were bad. It's just because you were looking to mom and dad to tell you about life. And then mom and dad were behaving in certain ways that you couldn't understand. And so you applied meaning to those things and you just came up with unhelpful, well, things that in the long run have been unhelpful to you. They were brilliant in the moment. They were the only thing that you could have come up with in the moment, but, but in the long run, they turned out to be limiting for you. Uh, and so a lot of this stuff, you won't actually even be able to get to the memories. Some of it you can, but a lot of it you can't. But what you can do is you can just think about this. You think about, well, look, how do two-year-olds, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds behave? Maybe you've, maybe you've had children, maybe you've observed children, and you kind of get a sense, okay, this is how these children behave. So probably I behaved in some similar ways, right? Like, a two-year-old is probably going to uh, is probably not going to be thinking about uh, like mo what mom and dad want. The two-year-old is probably just thinking about what they want. And so the two-year-old is just walking around and and doing stuff and and getting into things and not necessarily cleaning up and not being considerate of what mom and dad want. So mom and dad probably got annoyed at times at the behavior of the two-year-old, and mom and dad doing their best, which might have been pretty good, it might have been terrible, but whatever it was, their reactions for that two-year-old were confusing, scary sometimes. Right? You just want to be able to see that that's the case. Again, it's not saying that mom and dad were bad. It's just saying that's just how it is. Once you can see that you can just start to understand there's a pattern there. It's like, oh yeah, of course. I did these things, mom and dad responded in this way. Like, you know your, you know how they responded in general in your life, right? So you can understand that when you were two years old, they were probably responding in similar ways, maybe even less skillful, but to a two-year-old. And so you as a two-year-old, very non-resourceful, dealing with those reactions, you concluded, I'm not good enough. Just makes sense. 
you want to just see that and then realize, okay, but that was not actually, it was never actually true that I was not good enough. Like that was not actually there in reality. That was, that was a meaning that I assigned to it. So you just see that that was never actually inherent in anything, that you're not good enough, but you took on that belief, you assigned that meaning, and then you've rehearsed it over and over and over. But here's, once you've, once you're able to actually distinguish and see that that meaning is not inherent, then you can also start to do this. You can say, okay, well, imagine that uh, that other people were there viewing that situation. Would they all have drawn the conclusion that I'm not good enough? Obviously not, right? So what what kinds of conclusions might other people have drawn? Maybe more helpful conclusions like, uh, mom and dad seem pretty stressed. It has nothing to do with me. Uh, you know, um, mom and dad don't like my behavior. Right? Like th these are con more helpful conclusions to be drawn. So once you find a more helpful conclusion that seems true, you can then go back, like travel back in time in your imagination be there with your two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old self and just give them that information. Just say, look, I'm here with you. I'm here for your well-being. And let's, I just want you to know that, uh, that mom and dad are upset and it has nothing to do with you, right? It's not your fault. It doesn't mean anything about you. They, they just are stressed and they don't know how to deal with this situation in a better way. But I'm here with you. And then allow that to update the memories so that you can then give yourself that that knowledge and that support and go through and let that trickle through into all the memories moving forward in your life up to now so that you can then have that more resourceful understanding and that will update everything so you have to be willing to let go of the old way of understanding and allow things to update this will change everything for you in a powerful positive way so um that's all the time I'm going to take with that. But hopefully that gives you enough information that you can play with it and uh, and start getting some good results. Because remember, this change does not have to take a really long time. It can take, it can be, it can be very, very quick, actually. You just have to have the right knowledge and then you have to put it into practice consistently. So uh, as I say, please put it into practice, get results. Let me know your results. If you have questions, uh, you're, I welcome you to ask your questions. And uh, for those who are here live, we'll stay on for the group coaching. And for everybody else who's watching this on YouTube, I just want to make a few final, say a few final words before ending the recording. Um, number one, I am still offering free introductory coaching calls. So for those who are interested in that, you can find out more by going to joeylot.com slash intro, I-N-T-R-O, and the link will be in the description on YouTube. Uh, for those who are interested in attending these meetings live, you're welcome to do so. You can uh, get that information by signing up for my newsletter on my website, joeylot.com. Also a link in the description. And uh, for those who are interested in a uh, systematic approach to structuring a simple daily routine that will support you in getting the results that you want in your life, uh, you may be interested in the Manifesting Truth program that I offer. It is a paid program, and you can find more information at my website at joeylot.com slash manifesting-truth, and I'll provide a link in the description as well. I think that's it. Uh, so last thing I'll say for those who are watching on YouTube is blessings to you, and I'll see you next time.